Many of our patients admitted to internal medicine either have a history of atrial fibrillation or develop atrial fibrillation while admitted to hospital. When we consider these patients, we should always be thinking about their risk of stroke and subsequently consider their need for anticoagulation, and that's going to be the subject of today's talk. The first objective will be to discuss when we actually have to anticoagulate our patients with atrial fibrillation. And secondly, we'll discuss what bridging is and when this might be required. Let's jump right in. When we talk about atrial fibrillation, the first thing we should calculate is the annual risk of stroke. And this can actually be done with a CHADS score. A patient might have a history of congestive heart failure, hypertension, age greater than 65, diabetes, or stroke or TIA. Each aspect of the CHAD score is a risk factor for stroke. The first four are worth one point each on our scoring system, while the history of stroke or TIA is worth two points out of a total of six. When we calculate our CHAD score itself, each score corresponds to a certain annual risk of stroke, and this can be found easily on a point of care application. The importance is to be able to interpret the total score. The decision to anticoagulate always requires considering the risks of bleeding versus the benefits of anticoagulation. The higher the total CHAD score, the higher the risk of annual stroke and the greater the benefit to anticoagulation. Generally, a score greater or equal to 1 is an indication for anticoagulation, and for that we can use warfarin, oral anticoagulants, or injectable heparin. If patients have a score of 0, we have to consider whether or not they have a history of coronary artery disease. For patients with a history of coronary artery disease and a CHAD score of zero, we would suggest anticoagulation with aspirin instead. Patients with no coronary artery disease and a CHAD score of zero don't need any form of anticoagulation, despite the fact that they may have atrial fibrillation. Now finally, consider that the use of anticoagulation is to prevent an annual risk of stroke, and so there isn't necessarily an urgency to anticoagulate patients right away, especially when you consider an in-hospital setting where there may be procedures or other uh, contraindications to anticoagulation, and that's something to keep in mind. Now let's talk about bridging. When we have patients who are on oral forms of anticoagulation, these often take days to wear off. And occasionally we have to stop the anticoagulation for things such as procedures in hospital. Bridging is the use of a shorter acting form of anticoagulation while patients are not therapeutically anticoagulated on their home form of anticoagulation. And we often use something like heparin for this indication. It's an IV infusion that can be easily turned on and off and wears off in less than six hours. So how do we decide who gets bridged or not? Well, we have done trials and we've found that there's actually been no difference in the risk of clotting, but an increase in the risk of bleeding when patients are bridged. However, in those trials, there wasn't a significant proportion of patients who had a CHAD score of five or six, unfortunately. And of course, these are our patients with the highest risk of stroke. As a result, in practice, we find that for patients with a CHAD score of 5 or 6, we tend to opt to bridge these patients. However, for patients with a CHAD score less than or equal to 4, we feel comfortable to stop their oral anticoagulation without the need for bridging in the context of procedures or other in-hospital reasons to hold anticoagulation. And there we have it, a quick summary on anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation for in-hospital management.